how to scale up to a million dollars in sales as a UK or US based lifestyle brand on Shopify with our data first approach. So as you can see here, these are some of the brands that we are currently working with or we've worked with in the past and we've helped uh, you know, achieve that. Uh, we've also got a bunch of testimonials, which you can also see on our portfolio page. Um, here we have the video testimonials, just you know, so you can see this is all real. You know, these are not uh, you know fake testimonials or fake screenshots or anything like that. Um, so as you can see here on the left hand side, we spent one hundred thirty six thousand dollars for this brand, and we generated four hundred sixty five thousand um, dollars, and that is in twenty twenty three as well. So no outdated screenshots from pre iOS fourteen, nothing like that. This was from January 1st to April 25th. Then we have a year to day um, screenshot where we spent $326,000 for this brand and we generated seven figures, $1,229,000, uh, 376 and 25 cents with a 3.77 return on ad spend between uh, the 26th of April, 2022 and the 26th of April, 2023. So within the space of 12 months. Then we have a jewelry store where we spent 116, oh sorry, we generated $116,995 and 68 cents with a $38,000 ad spend, which again is a 3x return on ad spend. Um, $11,000 here with $77,000 generated. Uh, this was in the last 30 days. So 26th of March, 2023 to the 24th of April, 2023. So as you can see, all results from this year, no outdated screenshots or nothing like that. So who is this for? Well, this document contains all of the best practices that we have implemented ourselves to help UK and US uh, Shopify stores scale to 1 million in sales. So if you're in the UK or you're in the US, you have a lifestyle brand, you have a streetwear brand or a fashion brand, where that is male or female, doesn't really matter. If you're currently operating on Shopify and you're doing at least 10K a month in sales, then this is for you. So we've written this specifically for both male and female brand owners who have the ambitions to scale their business and achieve in sales of a million plus through Facebook advertising. So if you're reading this, chances are you know, you've already established a solid foundation for your business, but scaling up can be a daunting task. What I wanna do with this document is provide you with the guidance you need to help you take your business to the next level. So we'll provide you with all of the insights and best practices on how you can leverage Facebook ads uh, to reach your target audience and generate more sales. So before we begin, all of the examples, case studies and references are real. You know, we are real growth consultants based in the UK. My business partner is, uh, is in Liverpool in the UK. I am in Amsterdam in the Netherlands and no, we have nothing to sell you here. I just wanna show you how you can do it for yourself and then you can think about working with us if you like what you hear. So my goal is to simply give you as much value as possible for free that you know nobody can basically question us whether or not these strategies work. So what is currently happening in the industry? Well, quite frankly, the blind are leading the blind. So the quality of these generic cookie cutter agencies, which I like to call them, um, basically the service delivery there has fallen to an all time low. With the rise of these online courses and coaches and business opportunities that you can find online, we're seeing a lot of young aspiring entrepreneurs start online marketing and consultant businesses. They'll purchase an online course or join an online coaching program expecting to learn from a master at their craft. But what they don't realize is that these coaches do not make money from e-commerce or they don't make money from running an agency themselves, they make money from selling the program. So when it actually comes to service delivery and running the ads for brands like yourself, they are learning outdated methods and they are not up to date with the current methods of getting results for their clients with paid traffic. So you've probably experienced it yourself, uh, some agency that's coming up to you. Uh, you know, usually it starts with cold email outreach, right? They'll send you an email saying, hey, we can help you scale up to X amount. Um, and then when you actually get on a call with them, they tell you you need to wait at least 90 days until you see any kind of profit whatsoever. But the practice of taking three months to test and ramp up ads or season the pixel or whatever they call it, it's absolutely ridiculous. Quite frankly, it's agency talk designed to impose a minimum flat fee for three months without delivering any kind of result for you. It basically translates to, I am not competent in this area. And then to make things worse, most agencies also consist of 
hundreds of outsourced contractors and button pushers. Um, I've experienced this myself. You know, some of the larger agencies actually come to me to white label Facebook ad services for them. So chances are, you know, these agencies that are trying to reach out to you, they're trying to push the work onto me. So they employ uniform strategies for all clients following the same gurus and utilizing cookie cutter approaches. When the platforms change, which you know we all experience quite frequently, they struggle to adjust promptly, which has a negative impact on their clients and then also obviously on you. That is why their methods fail. To succeed in the current climate, ads need to generate profits within one month or less. So yes, it does not take three months, it does not take 90 days, if you use the approaches and the methods that we explain in this document, you should see profits immediately. So in this day and age, efficiency and speed are paramount. Then secondly, inflation and recession is leading to a need for greater efficiency in business operations. So as a result of this upcoming recession, whether or not we're in one is obviously up for debate, but brands are faced with two options. They can either increase prices or improve the operational efficiency in order to boost profit margins and achieve sustainable growth. So in this environment, it's crucial for brands to focus on the most profitable segments of their market and avoid overextending themselves. More on this in just a moment. So the days of growth through online presence alone, uh, as was seen during the COVID pandemic, is now well and truly gone. So rather than focusing on vanity metrics, such as flashy production campaigns, uh, brands will prioritize investing their resources where they're most likely to see a return. Again, we'll be going into this in a lot of depth and detail shortly. AI is making marketers lazy. So as you probably already realize, we now have ChatGPT and you know a lot of open AI sources that can help us augment what is currently working. But with the advent of sophisticated AI algorithms, Facebook media buyers can now use automated tools to target specific audiences, analyze data and optimize their ad campaigns. However, the reality in the current market is that this technology has made these generic cookie cutter agencies lazy particularly when it comes to promoting you know, fashion brands and lifestyle brands, etc., on Shopify. By relying too heavily on campaign budget optimization, Advantage Plus campaigns and dynamic creatives, agencies overlook the important nuances in the market. They miss out on key opportunities and ultimately fail to deliver the best results possible for their clients. Then thirdly, relying solely on user-generated content, UGC, uh, or influencers, that is now a thing of the past. You know, this was very much trending back in the end of 2022, the start of 2023. Um, obviously, you know, user-generated content has been around for a while, but it really hit its peak towards the end of 2022. Um, it's been a buzzword for quite some time now, and its popularity has skyrocketed with the rise of TikTok. However, it seems that this trend is now reaching its peak, and there are several reasons for that. Number one, the sheer volume of UGC available online has now reached such a level that it's become harder and harder for businesses to stand out. With everyone using UGC, it's losing this wow factor and it's becoming somewhat oversaturated. So nowadays, when you see a user-generated piece of content online, you no longer stop scrolling because it's the 15th or you know, 16th one that you've seen already. Secondly, there is a growing sense of mistrust surrounding user-generated content, particularly in the wake of fake news scandals that have plagued social media platforms. This has led to the decline of credibility of user-generated content and businesses are becoming increasingly wary uh, of relying on it. Thirdly, as businesses become more sophisticated in their digital marketing efforts, they are also discovering that user-generated content isn't always the most effective approach. While it's undoubtedly a powerful tool for creating engagement, it doesn't necessarily, necessarily translate into sales or conversions. So what we should actually be doing will obviously be explained uh, further down this document. Um, but as a result, many companies are now looking for more targeted and data-driven approaches to their marketing. So while user-generated content has undoubtedly been a game changer in the world of digital marketing, it's important to remember that these trends come and go. As with any trends, there is a risk of overhyping it, and it seems to be the case now with UGC. As the novelty wears off, businesses will start to look for new and innovative ways to engage their audiences. Now, this does not mean that user-generated content will disappear altogether, but it's likely to become less prominent as businesses seek out new approaches uh, when it comes to their digital marketing. Ultimately, the key to success in this space is to be agile and adaptable 
always looking for new and innovative ways to engage with your audience and stay ahead of the curve. Now, the core concept of this document is the following. It's never been as easy as it is today to scale up to 1 million in sales, and it will also never ever be this easy again. We've yet to reach that equilibrium point when it comes to online shopping, and despite it seem like everyone now has their own online store or online fashion brands or own uh, you know, Shopify store, anything like that, there's still far more demand than these stores can actually handle for now. So the best time to scale an online fashion brand or online lifestyle brand was 10 years ago. The second best time is today. With artificial intelligence still in its infancy, tracking still fairly accurate, privacy policies still relatively lenient, we still have this golden window opportunity, but the clock is ticking. Agencies, like I said before, are sprouting up from everywhere, ran by 18 year olds claiming to understand the market, but the reality, however, is that they are deploying cookie cutter tactics, burning away your hard earned money and demanding hefty monthly retainers in order to do so. We are performance based growth partners that run our own Shopify fashion brands and have developed a system that allows us to scale up fashion brands with our data driven less is more approach. And the approach that we apply consists of four pillars. Pillar number one is crafting your offer. So identifying your best selling products in the current market. Second pillar is conversion rate optimization. Identify and optimize your buyer's journey, which we'll be getting into in just a second. Thirdly, understanding your numbers. So how much can you actually spend to acquire a customer whilst maximizing profitability? And in theory, once all three pillars are set up correctly, we have our fourth pillar and that is augmenting your store traffic. So when your metrics show opportunity for scale, you increase your paid traffic to the store. Okay. So imagine you had a time machine and you were able to go back to the early nineties. Uh, you know, when you're there, you stumble onto a fashion brand owner and you're trying to explain to him or her that customers in 2023 are able to order something you know, off their store from a small device that they hold in their hand and save in their pocket. To make things even more unbelievable for these people, uh, the average delivery to time is about 24 hours in 2023, right? Can you imagine their disbelief? Well, chances are if someone from 2040 came to us and did the same thing to you right now, explaining all of the developments that have happened since, you'll respond in a similar way as the guy from the 90s would. It's predicted that more than 90% of purchases will be made online by 2040. With the demand increasing, so is the supply. So that means that now is probably the easiest time ever to scale up your Shopify store to a million in sales and the market is going to be getting more and more crowded as the years go by. So if you want to take advantage of the opportunities that are at your fingertips right now, get better returns on your paid marketing endeavors and grow your brand to the next level, then this is for you. So phase number one, crafting your offer. What we need to do is focus on what works. So for Shopify store owners of fashion brands, the key to success is to focus on what works. The Pareto principle states that roughly 80% of the effects come from 20% of the courses. It's a concept named after the Italian economist Vilfredo Pareto, who observed that 80% of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the population. So in business, this principle suggests that roughly 80% of a company's revenue comes from 20% of its products. By identifying the key 20% of the products that lead to the majority of results, you can actually optimize your resources and maximize your output. So as I mentioned before, less is more. So as you can see here, this is a screenshot of one of our clients uh, where we have the best selling products. And what we've done for this client now is rather than showing all these expensive brands, which this client also has on the site, we've actually only started running ads to the best sellers. Feel free to check out No Chaos on the Facebook ads library if you want to see a real life example of that. Okay, many brands are making the mistake of trying to sell all of their products or pushing ads to products that they can't really sell themselves organically, which basically just spreads their budget too thin and causes their margins to drop. They invest time and resources creating content for every single product, 
only to find out that many don't sell as fast as they would like. This can lead to cash being tied up, an inventory that isn't moving, and the brand being slowed down from taking full advantage of market conditions. To avoid this downward spiral, it's important to focus 80% or more of your marketing, your ads, and inventory on your best sellers. These are the products that have already proven to have demand in your market, and by giving customers more of what they want, your profit will go up and your costs will lower. The most successful fashion brands like Louis Vuitton and Chanel, they don't force customers to buy their products. Instead, they use customer data to determine what works and what doesn't. So by focusing on your best sellers, you streamline your strategy and create repeatable and predictable buy and selling cycles. Your marketing and ads will also become more efficient as you focus on just your best sellers instead of everything all at once. So this allows you to take advantage of cheaper advertising costs and experience bigger growth even during recessions, if that is what we're in or not. In short, less is more when it comes to marketing and selling your fashion products. By focusing on what works and doubling down on your best sellers, you can create profitable, like a profitable upward spiral that allows you to thrive and scale while your competitors fall behind. So find what works and then just do more of that. This will lead to faster sales, higher profits, and a stronger market position in your brand. So how can you identify your best sellers? Well, Shopify actually already do this for us. So there's a few things that you need to do. Uh, first of all, you need to go to analytics on the left-hand side. And then what you need to do is toggle um, the calendar to year to date. So usually it'll be on today or yesterday. Uh, make sure that is year to date and then see what your all-time best sellers are. Then what I like to do is I like to go to the start of when a store was started and then analyze what the actual best seller was of all time. Compare that to the bestseller of the year to date and then see if there's anything that I can take away from that data wise. So as you can see here, log into your Shopify account, go to analytics, on the analytics section, go to top products by units sold. And then to make sure the data is accurate, head over to the timeline button on the left top of your screen. Make sure the timeline is set to lifetime of the store or year to date and then cross reference those two. And then these are the products you should be focusing on. And this could actually mean that you need to reintroduce a product that was previously sold out and you were not actually planning on producing again. Because if that is what works, if that is what the market wants, then that is what you should focus on. Okay, now here's some tips on how you can increase your average order value and your lifetime value, which will be very important for the next phases in this document. So fashion brand owners on Shopify can increase their LTV, lifetime value, and AOV, average order value, by implementing effective strategies. So to increase the AOV, having a frequently bought together tab in the slide cart drawer can encourage customers to add complementary items to their cart thereby increasing the overall pages conversion value. If your Shopify store does not actually have this, then you can download the slide card draw app. There's actually a clickable link, uh, takes you to the slide card draw app. Um, there's a bunch of free and paid apps that do basically the same thing. So just find one that works for you. Then secondly, to increase the average order value, another app we often use is Reconvert. Reconvert is an app that lets you add different types of upsells to your checkout and thank you page. So as you can see, this is the thank you page. This is what someone sees when they place an order. And then there's a bunch of one-time offers that they can basically add to their existing order. So they've already placed an order, you've got their credit card details on file, and then there's a bunch of products that are then discounted uh, with a specific discount based on what you decide that they can click on and it will automatically add to the existing order by billing the card that they used on the initial order. And it's a great way to increase the average order value by getting people to basically place an impulse purchase after the initial order, okay? And then an approach to increase the lifetime value is to create nurture campaigns via either Klaviyo, which is an email marketing software, or remarketing via Facebook, which again will be discussed in this document. By providing personalized content and exclusive promotions to existing customers, brands can build loyalty and encourage repeat purchases. Additionally, offering free shipping or rewards for repeat purchases can also contribute to increased lifetime value. So by emailing your existing customer list, so people have placed an order saying, hey, if you order again, you get free shipping, or if you order again, you get an extra 20% off, anything along those lines. 
Then the second pillar, optimizing your buyer's journey. So just like focusing on the best sellers, we apply a similar tactic to the overall buyer's journey. Following the 80-20 principle, we optimize the most common buyer's journey as much as we can. So as you can see here, 20% of products will produce 80% of the results and the remaining 80% of the products will only produce 20% of the results. So by knowing that, we can optimize our store to maximize the amount of results we get. Over time, mobile shopping has gained a tremendous share of the global e-commerce market and customers are increasingly using their mobile devices for various online shopping activities. So with the rise of e-com and mobile e-com, there's an increased demand for speed, relevance and ease when it comes to their mobile shopping experience. Because let's face it guys, how frustrating is it when you want to order something on your phone and the website is not optimized for mobile and you're trying to pinch and squeeze the website in order for it to work or you tilt it to the side to see if it works better that way you know gone are the days that you can just simply set up a website that looks good on your desktop and laptop uh, you know a web shop needs to be optimized for mobile analysts will even go as far as to say to prioritize mobile optimization over desktop functionality we actually have a couple of clients where if you look at their shop on wet on the on the desktop it does not look good at all but all of our traffic comes from mobile so we've optimized the website for mobile as much as possible and these guys are on the way to scale to seven figures okay sleek design conveys higher so far we've concluded that we need to focus on the best selling products and we need to ensure that our buyer's journey on mobile is as user-friendly as possible a user-friendly mobile web shop contains a simplistic and clear design that's the precondition if you want to stay relevant, especially when it comes to fashion and lifestyle. What I'd actually recommend doing is make your web shop white. So no more color backgrounds, nothing like that. Black websites do not convert as well either. Um, we have a client that the whole brand is basically black. So they needed a black website, but the white website, despite what he thought, converted 2% higher than the black website. So despite his whole brand being a dark color, uh, we actually had the web shop on a white color and that converts much better. The average customer journey will look something like this. So a potential customer clicks on an ad, a potential customer then lands on the home page or the collection page, depending on where you send them to. The potential customer clicks on a product they like, they add the product to cart, they initiate checkout, and then they place an order. And this is the order in which we need to view our funnel. More on this in a second. So the metric we use to analyze the optimization of the buyer's journey is called the store conversion rate. You can find this metric under the analytics tab again. So the same tab that we used to identify our best sellers, we can use that same tab and look at the conversion rate, which is usually on the left hand side. So if your store conversion rate is 1%, that means that for every 100 people that visit your website, you get one purchase. The aim is to get your conversion rate as high as possible. However, there is no right or wrong conversion rate. It depends on a number of factors, your profit margin, for example, your average order value, and uh, from a paid traffic standpoint, your cost per outbound clip. Again, more on this later. Above, you can see a side-by-side -side comparison of a client Shopify store brand before and after we implemented the changes mentioned in this document. So on the left-hand side, as you can see, the 1st of August to the 31st of August, our clients did $12,000 in sales. This was before they came on board with us. Then in November, after we implemented the changes, uh, we started running paid ads to their store as well. We did a full CRO audit for them. They made $63,000, which is a 260% increase. Now, of course, we do have to mention that November contains Black Friday, so we can't take all the credit for this, but it's good to see you know, an increased result nonetheless. So the biggest change we implemented was optimizing every page of the buyer's journey for mobile. So one thing I'd recommend you guys do is have the add to cart button above the fold. So in the early days of publishing, above the fold was a term used for content that appeared on the top half of the front page of a newspaper. When newspapers were displayed on the newsstands, the headlines and lead stories that appeared above the fold were the most visible. And this is now a term that we describe the content a consumer can see on your web page without having to scroll. So as you can see here on the right hand side, we have a screenshot from Gymshark. Disclaimer, Gymshark is not our client. I just like to use this as an example. And as you can see, the first thing we see without scrolling 
is the product image and the add to cart button. So Gymshark have prioritized the add to cart button above the reviews, above the product title, and above any other product descriptions. That is how important the add to cart button is to them. So it's extremely important, essential in my opinion, to have your add to cart button above the fold. So viewable without having to scroll. If it's not feasible with your current web shop or your theme or your layout or anything like that, opt for a sticky cart button that appears immediately after the page loads. This will increase the user experience and increase your conversion rate from those viewing your items and those adding those items to their cart. Then speaking of user experience shipping costs, we want to reduce the amount of friction a customer experiences when browsing your Shopify store. The offer needs to be irresistible to compete in a competitive industry like fashion. So any unforeseen hurdles that a potential customer must cross can have a detrimental impact on the overall website conversion rate and then of course your sales. So even the slightest friction experienced after a potential customer has added an item to cart can cause that potential customer to abandon it. Shipping costs are one of the top reasons consumers abandon their shopping cart and an extremely easy way to overcome that is by offering free shipping and incorporating the average shipping price in the price of the garments or the products. So increase the price of your items by seven to 10% and offering free shipping will leave you with a similar bottom line after the sale, but nowhere near as many abandoned carts. Then thirdly, social proof. Whether we realize it or not, humans are pack animals. We need one another, we need to feel a sense of belonging and we need socialization. And because of this, our decisions are consciously and or subconsciously influenced by the choices, opinions and actions of the people around us. So when making a purchase decision, our brain looks for a mental shortcut that will allow us to make a decision, pass judgments or solve a problem quickly and with the least amount of mental effort. In other words, to learn what is correct, we look at what others are doing or have done in the past. So not only do we look to others for buying decisions, we also depend on it for almost everything else we do. Social proof and testimonials can increase your conversion uh, rate on a sales page by 34%. So for 50% of all consumers, their very next step after reading, reading a positive review about a fashion brand is to visit their Instagram or website which is one step closer to the checkout or even getting them on your email list. So as mentioned previously, uh, we want to decrease the amount of friction that potential customers experience when visiting your webshop and to make this a no brainer for them, the webshop needs to include as much social proof as possible, including but not limited to reviews, user generated content, ratings and comments. Okay, so now to put all the pieces together, running paid traffic. Now that we know our website is as optimized as can be, it's now starting to get people to your store. Facebook advertising can be one of the quickest ways to drive traffic to your website. It can be a great strategy that will bring targeted traffic that is found on both Facebook as well as Instagram, and Facebook ads are more important than ever, especially if you're a fashion store, a lifestyle brand, or anything like that, that actually cares about your brand and wants to establish an online presence. Okay, so just a quick mention, organic reach of Facebook pages and Instagram pages is declining day by day. It's now currently under 5%, but Facebook ads targeting, and tracking and management, etc., are still the most sophisticated in the game. Over 10 million businesses are actively advertising on Facebook by the end of 2021. The takeaway here is that the market is huge, but so is the competition. With organic reach not cutting it, businesses are now turning to paid ads to make this platform a proper battle royale for online presence. But make no mistake, pay to play does not mean the Facebook advertising game is paid to win as well. You can't guarantee that companies who spend a ton of money will do better than competing brands with smaller budgets. The Facebook algorithm gets smarter every day, but so do its users. So if your ad is top quality, you know, so the copy and creative is top notch, it's likely to draw more conversions even if you don't go all out on your budget. Similarly, you can also splash the cash and not see any results. That's why you need to play your cards right and play the long game. That's when Facebook becomes worth it. Let's dive into it. So before we actually go into Facebook, I want you to understand your numbers, which is the third pillar, setting up your analytics correctly. So there are many metrics that you can track, but there are only a few that matter. 
Most founders spend money on ads, marketing, and hiring agencies without actually knowing their numbers clearly. This leads to burning money fast. As the saying goes, what gets measured gets managed. So you must be clear on what exact numbers you should know and track in order to scale profitably. The core analytics are the true break-even return on ad spend or true break-even ROAS and CPA on Facebook and then AOV, average order value, on Shopify. So to calculate your break-even ROAS, we take one and divide that by your profit margin percentage. If you have a different profit margin percentage for every single product, I would recommend just taking the average profit margin percentage at this first stage. So let's say, for example, your profit margin percentage is 60%. So that means if you sell a $100 product, 60% of that is profit, 40% of that is costs. One divided by 60 is 1.66 which means your break-even ROAS is 1.66. You need a 1.66 return on ad spent on Facebook to break even. If your ROAS is above 1.66, so it's a two, that means you are profitable. If your ROAS is under 1.66, let's say 1.5, then you are losing money. However, let's now calculate your true break-even cost per acquisition because there are a few metrics that we've now forgotten. Let's say your AOV is 50 and your break-even CPA is 30. Why 30? Because, like I said, 60% profit margin. Uh, we need 1.66 to break even, so 60% of 50 is 30. This means if it costs you more than $30 to acquire a customer uh, with an AOV of 50, you are negative. If you know it's less, then it's positive. So if it costs you more than $30 to get a purchase, you know, it's not profitable. But there are other factors to keep in mind, and this is where a lot of agencies make this mistake as well. The reporter's revenue you see on Facebook is the data that Shopify actually sends back to Facebook. It's the cash amount that people check out with. However, that is not what you receive. The amount you see on Facebook includes costs like VAT, if you're in Europe, and shipping, which is you know, just an example. Uh, with the $50 example, you'd have to face it up 20%, 21% VAT if you're in Europe, and then let's say $5 for shipping, meaning that you don't actually take home 50, which you see on Facebook, you take home $34.50. So if your CPA was 30, you actually made a loss because we haven't factored in other costs yet. So this is a quick example, you know, break even CPA is 30, um, but now with the 21% VAT and the $5 shipping, your break even CPA was actually 14.50. And this is what a lot of brands just completely forget or simply just don't know when they do this calculation. So to accurately calculate this, you first start with your gross profit. Let's say your reported revenue is $400, VAT and shipping was $100, which leaves you with $300. That is your net revenue. Then you have your cost of goods sold, which is $100 for this example. So that is $200 gross profit. Now, we take your gross profit and divide it by your net revenue, okay? So in this case, we take $200 and divide that by $300, which makes 66%. So if we take the example of $100 in revenue, with a 66% margin, you make $66. Remember, we want the true reported revenue from ads. So continuing the 66% gross profit margin, as an example, we have 34% left, right? So 100 minus 66 is 34. So we have 34% left. So let's say on Facebook, you make $200 from spending 100. So your return on ad spend is two on Facebook, um, which you know, obviously sounds good on the surface, but what is the real revenue there? If you spend 100 on Facebook and you make 200 back with the VAT, if you, again, if you're in Europe, that is 19% or 21%, you know, depending on where you're at, that's $162. Then $162 minus 55, which is 54% of 162, because we've got that 66% gross margin, which now equals $107. So now you have to also minus the ad spend, which was $100, which actually only leaves us which, with a $7 profit from the ads. And we're only now taking cost of goods sold, right? We're not um, you know, taking into consideration overhead costs or anything like that. This is mainly front end. So even with that two ROAS, nine times out of 10, the math doesn't work out. It has to be above a two ROAS in this case. So that is why it's important to do this calculation before you'll turn on any ad. And you want to be absolutely clear on what your spend and returns on uh, in order to get that profit. So do this calculation with your own numbers and it'll be more much more clearer to you okay 
and then we want to adjust our columns for a clear overview so sort of back to the facebook stuff now now we've got a better understanding of our store metrics and numbers we need to have just as good of an understanding of our facebook metrics as well because obviously facebook offers a lot of data but it can get quite overwhelming so remember the customer journey that we mapped out in phase two we're going to be rebuilding that in facebook so that we have all of the metrics that we need to focus on and what I would recommend is obviously adding this as a preset or save it as the default so that when you go into your ad account, you see all the columns from left to right. So what you need to do is you go to columns on the right hand side and then click on customize columns and then just delete all of the existing metrics and add the following metrics. Delivery, ad set name, budget, amount spent, outbound click, which is a click that goes from Facebook onto another website the cost per outbound click, the outbound click through rate, view content, cost per view content, add to cart, cost per add to cart, initiate checkout, cost per initiate checkout, purchase, cost per purchase, purchase conversion value, and then the ROAS, return on ad spend. So when you've selected all of these columns, make sure that on the left of the pop-up you say, uh, you know, save this as a preset, and then it should some, look something like this. So amount spent, outbound clicks, cost per outbound click, click through rate, content view, uh, cost per content view, add to cart, cost per add to cart, and so on and so forth, okay? So make sure you save this as a preset. And then quick side note, when selecting like your view content and adds to cart, etc., you'll have like a few extra options like offline adds to cart and stuff. Feel free to deselect those. We wanna keep things nice and simple, okay? So now that we have our store optimized, we know what our best sellers are, we know our metrics, and we also have our metrics set up in Facebook, we can now augment the store traffic. So when running Facebook ad campaigns for your Shopify store, ask yourself, what is it that you want? Because if you're serious about scaling your brand to a million in sales, then I'm 100% certain that you're now going to say, I want more customers, I want more sales. And if that is the case, then please ignore vanity metrics like engagement, Instagram followers, reach, and traffic. Shopify brands almost always want more purchases. And for this reason, the only campaign that we recommend to our clients are sales campaigns. This used to be called conversions, now it's called sales in Facebook. Conversion campaigns or sales campaigns are basically a way of telling Facebook and Instagram that you only want potential customers on the website, not just anybody. So you optimize for a conversion event, which obviously we recommend being purchased, and by doing only this, by only optimizing for a sales campaign, we've helped our clients 15x their ad spend through running consistent conversion campaigns, and we'll basically show you the exact structure below. Okay, so there are basically three campaigns that we'd recommend. The top of funnel, TOF, and at this level, you're focused on cold traffic, uh, potential customers basically that have never heard of your Shopify brand. Middle of funnel, MOF, at this level, you're focused on potential customers that you know that know who you are but have not yet placed an order. And then we have bottom of funnel, BOF, and these are your warm leads. These are people that have been on your website, they've taken a look around, they've maybe added an item to cart, but they just haven't pulled the trigger yet. We're basically going to provide them with an offer that they can't refuse, okay? Throughout the different stages of this funnel, you need to make sure that your messaging is different to reflect the stage that your potential customer is in at the buyer's journey, okay? audience targeting. So the ad set level, you have campaign level, ad set level, and ad level. In the ad set level, that is where you outline your audience to Facebook. And this is where you can include interests that are relevant to your customer base. However, it's not the case of making your audiences as specific as possible because this leaves no room for Facebook's machine learning to do its thing. By simplifying this process, you'll quickly realize you'll be able to bring in an insane amount of revenue uh, because like I said at the start, less is more. Interest-based targeting is great for testing out specific images and if you want to try out a image on a specific audience, but it's not the way to go when you want to scale. The aim of the game is to get your ads to convert on broad, which is the broadest audience possible, no interest targeting. For one simple reason, it's the biggest audience. So on the left-hand side here, you can see the five stages of awareness uh, from the book uh, Breakthrough Advertising by Eugene Schwartz. And the basic premise here is that it's not enough to have a great product or service to sell. You also need to meet the potential customer where they're at in their current frame of mind. So as you can see here, the top obviously is the most aware then we have product aware, we have solution aware, 
problem aware and then we have people that are unaware obviously the large majority of people are unaware and only a small percentage of people are most aware and these people they know your product and what it does but they haven't gotten around to purchasing it yet so this is your bottom of funnel as aware, right so as you can see the most aware audience is the smallest and these people are ready to buy and ready to buy now but this audience is not infinitely scalable the unaware audience as you can see here is by far the largest um, but also the hardest to convince so if you can siphon this audience into your funnel and make it convert you'll have struck gold so when scaling using detailed targeting actually makes zero business sense for three reasons it adds cost okay customization on our ad delivery comes at a premium so we reach few people for more money which is obviously bad these audiences ultimately fatigue. They are depreciating assets. It's like buying a stock high and selling it low. You invest heavily in training Facebook's machine learning to do something that only gets worse over time. And your cost is obviously you know, a little bit more every single day. And then lastly, these audiences are ultimately obsolete technology. So back when Facebook first started, it was basically a knockoff of Google Display. You had random distribution in the audience where your ads went and now, ad delivery and impressions are in so the first ads you see on your instagram feed which is usually like the second or third post nowadays is a much higher quality and is much more prevalent when people say you know this instagram ad is dumb or it doesn't make sense or anything like that or the targeting is off that is usually like the 15th or 16th ad that they've seen on their feed and that is only like 10 minutes into a scroll and that ad so that 15th or 16th ad was actually way more expensive to show that person because quality impressions are in when you have to pay extra to invest into the appreciating assets what you're also doing is preventing the vast majority of people that want to see your content from ever seeing it so you're not just telling facebook to display your ads in a specific direction you're also telling Facebook not to display ads in all other directions. As 85% of media buyers are still unaware of this phenomenon, brands were seeing a stagnation of results that were generated through the ads, and so much so that even Facebook decided to take matters into their own hands by showing your ads to audiences outside of your targeting regardless of what you set. So you can see this for yourself in the ad set level. When you select an interest, it actually says, we may deliver ads beyond your audiences for your selected objective if it's likely to improve performance. So because all of these agencies and media buyers are doing this very specific detailed targeting and not getting results, Facebook obviously saw less people getting results on Facebook, which means less people were media buying. So they actually have to take mass into their own hands by adding this section and this feature so that people can start getting results again. So technically, this means that even if you're doing interest targeting, you're still targeting broad, but you're just paying a premium price for it. So when do we use interest-based targeting? We use it for quick wins and short-term creative testing, angle testing, copy testing, etc. Then and only then. If we want to scale, we scale on broad or we attempt to scale on broad. So for the top of funnel, when we're acquiring new customers, again, we recommend going for broad. This also means leaving the gender broad, leaving the age broad, etc. Uh, because you know, basically by doing this, you're giving Facebook the opportunity to find the right customers for your business. Then middle of funnel and bottom of funnel. Consumers that do not purchase the first time around, which is highly likely because there could be a hundred reasons why they don't purchase the first time around. They're too busy, they're unsure on the product, or they don't like the shipping cost, or you know they lost data on the phone or anything like that. Um, and that is why retargeting is vital. Sometimes consumers just need a simple, gentle reminder that they were about to purchase something. So we recommend retargeting customers continuously throughout the different stages of the buyer's journey. Um, it's a different story, of course, if someone drops off on your homepage after viewing, you know, well, after not viewing a single product uh, in comparison to someone that's dropped off at the point of initial checkout, right? So therefore, your message at each stage of the buyer's journey should be different. Further down the funnel they get, the more to the point the retargeting needs to be. For example, in the case that somebody has initiated checkout but not placed an order, you could retarget that exact audience and offer free shipping uh, in your ad copy as that ethical bribe in order to get the potential customer to come back. Okay, so retargeting audiences that we'd recommend are website visitors in the last 180 days that have not placed an order, Facebook engages in the last 365 days that have not purchased, Instagram engages, same thing again, 365 not purchased, and then for the bottom of funnel, view content or add it to cart in the last 30 days but have not purchased. Any audiences that are more specific than this 
are usually quite hard to target until you're actually at scale and you have enough events and enough traffic to do so. Okay, so now we get to the juicy part, starting or scaling your ads. So you've got the theory behind running successful campaigns, you've got the structure in mind. However, unless you know how to set up your ads, you'll be wasting a large percentage of your ad budget. So when it comes to ads, you need to ensure that the creative that you use, so the, you know, the image or the video, is enough to get the attention of your customers and stop them from scrolling on social media. And this is what I meant when I said that UGC is now losing its wow factor. It's not stopping people from scrolling as much as it used to. The best creatives do not have to be photo shoot uh, images that are perfect quality or anything like that. In fact, our research has actually found the opposite. The best performing creatives are usually shot on your phone camera and what we like to call lifestyle images. This includes just simple images of people wearing your garments, uh, your clothing items, you know, folded up neatly and then shot from above, or even just like the studio shot of the model wearing your garments. Customers love to see an accurate representation of what they will be receiving when it comes to fashion. Okay, so now moving on to the copy. This is the level at which you are targeting your audience and calling them out. Your copy needs to be on point and the way to ensure this is by focusing on your product and its benefits. So what problem are you solving with your product? Are you a fashion store focused on sustainability or do you focus on gym goers? Are you a streetwear band or a high-end boutique store? Whichever you are, that is what you need to focus on and that is what you need to use to call out your audience. So the most agencies now will regurgitate you know, something they read from an excerpt of Ogilvy and Advertising by David Ogilvy. They'll tell you to write long form copy to inform and educate your customers on what they are buying. And don't get me wrong, you know, this is still a good tactic, but not when you're selling products with an average order value below $300. So as I said, nowadays consumers attention span is less than three seconds. So the chunk of text feels spammy to them and it can actually even block the content. They won't read it and they will not buy your product. The new way is to have one or two sentences that resonate with your target audience, communicate the brand message, and then perhaps an emoji or two, but that is literally it. So as you can see on the right-hand side, these are some of the copy uh, headlines that we use. The Flex Runner is available now across five colorways. Timeless pieces redefined, buy ones wear forever. Dressing well is a form of good manners and make a statement with all new looks. Very short form copy, but very high converting copy nonetheless. So this allows your customers to clearly see the creatives, which will communicate the brand more than the copy ever will. A picture is worth a thousand words. The copy now supports the content instead of being the main focus. This leads to more clicks and more sales. Simply put, the content is now the copy. Okay, so once you get into retargeting, that is where your copy needs to change slightly and focus more on the social proof in forms of reviews and ethical bribes, small discounts, to get those potential customers over the line. Think back to what we mentioned about the you know, humans being pack animals. If your product is getting great reviews, more people will be willing to buy it or at least try it. You must finish your ad copy with a solid call to action, which I see so many brands still forget. Your potential customer needs to know what they must do in order to purchase your garments. You can also put this in the headline of your ad too or on you know, the ad level. So shop now, check out our collection, check out our bestsellers, check out our new collection and so on and so forth. Important to note, when looking at what pushes the needle most, the creative supersedes everything, okay? So the copy is nowhere near as important as the creative. In fact, I'd even go as far as to say that the copy is now becoming less and less important as the industry progresses. Attention spans are an all time low and customers just wanna browse and experience your brand for themselves rather than read long paragraphs about it. Okay, then the creative testing. When it comes to creative testing, there is no single approach that works 100% of the time. This is the approach that these cookie cutter agencies use. Simply because they've heard something or someone say it in a course, they saw a dropship guru say it in a YouTube video from 2018. But the fact of the matter is, no brand or no ad account is the same. Each brand has their own unique selling points, brand identity, and community. Each community and each customer responds differently to each different type of content. This is also the reason why we don't select manual placements, but we use Advantage Plus placements. Advantage Plus placements allow for the most efficient use of your budget and help control costs. So as I said earlier, the most cost-effective placements may not be the same for each advertiser depending on the ad type, creative design, and bid strategy. The Advantage Plus system is basically letting Facebook run it on all placements, is designed to get you the most optimization events at the lowest costs overall. 
Okay, with that said, we're not saying that there aren't any best practices or similarities that we've seen when it comes to scaling brands up to a 1 million in sales. There are three types of creatives that we've used for every brand that we've scaled up to this point. Number one, carousels. So carousels are an effective Facebook ad format that allows advertisers to showcase multiple images or videos in a single ad. Rather than just showing a single static image, advertisers can feature up to 10 different visuals with a single ad unit, each with its own headline, description, and call to action. So as you already know, online retail has now become like an online window shopping, right? People want to look before deciding to buy. So as a brand, you should give them that option. As a fashion brand, you want to show off what you're all about. You want to give people more options. If you show them a black top, but they were looking for the white top, it means they have to go to your website and find that white top themselves. Why not just show it directly on the platform? A great way of doing that is by using carousel ads, but not just any random carousel ads and definitely not a catalog sales ad, which we'll be getting into in just a second. Think about phase one, crafting your offer and focusing on the best sellers. In this case, we're going to be doing exactly the same. So what I want you to do is look at the eight to 10 best selling items, take all the images and then put them into carousels. Why? Because that is what people are looking for. They are proven to sell the most when people go to the website. So these are the items that are most likely to be purchased. So I recommend creating three different variations of the carousel, each with the same eight to 10 best selling items, but different images. So as you can see here, this is two examples of carousels showing you know, basically their best selling items. Okay, then secondly, so we've had carousels. Secondly is reels. With the rise of TikTok, Facebook had to quickly introduce a new creative type. Reels are short form vertical videos that also play on loop. Similar to the popular TikTok app, Reels allow advertisers to create engaging video content that captures the user's attention span and showcases their brand in a creative way. Unlike other video formats, Reels are highly optimized for mobile, ensuring that they look and feel natural on the user's feed. And then still images, you know, to this day, I still swear by still images. Single images are simple, but extremely effective uh, ad formats, and they convey a message through a powerful image or graphic. So if you have one image that stands out above all the rest, then use that as a still image in your ad. With still images, I'd also recommend making your ads in the nine to 16 ratio, because Facebook then automatically converts that ad to four by five for the feed, and then nine by 16 for stories. Okay, so now we know all of this, you know, what the best creatives are, uh, what I'd recommend, and then of course, keeping in mind that every brand is different, we can now launch our campaigns. So when starting or scaling your ads, make sure you've completed all of the necessary preparations mentioned above to ensure success. If you're new to ads or you've not done it in a while, uh, what I'd recommend doing is just starting off with your customer list. So upload your customer list to Facebook to create a lookalike audience. Start with a budget of $100 a day in the first week and then find the profitable CPA and ROAS following the structure I mentioned earlier. Allocate roughly 95%, so if you're on a $100 a day budget, $95 a day towards the top of the funnel, converting new customers with only 5%, in this case $5 for the retargeting, so middle of funnel and bottom of funnel. So with this current setup, because we're just starting out and we only have $100 a day, I'd recommend stacking the middle and the bottom of funnel together into one campaign and one ad set. So basically you'll have one campaign, one ad set with retargets and website visits 180 days and then Facebook and Instagram engages of the last 365 days that have not placed an order. And then we have the top of funnel, which is basically uh, cold traffic. Okay, so with the top of the funnel, I'd recommend starting with the three creatives that we mentioned before, the carousel, the single image and the reel. But as I mentioned earlier, every store is different. So you will need to find out what works for you. Once you figure out what creative type works best for your store, unpublish the other creatives and continue deploying more of what works. With your analytics set up properly, you'll know what your max CPA can be and the lowest targets you need to hit to be profitable. For instance, based on that $50 AOV example earlier, your CPA has to be under $30 to be profitable. Then once you test and identify ads with a profitable CPA and ROAS, raise the ad spend by 20% every day for as long as these ads remain profitable. Then move on to the section below, which is scaling. So scaling campaigns, just like when starting out, we still allocate 95% of the budget to converting new customers and in 5% or less of the budget is focused on remarketing. In other terms, 95% top of funnel, 5% middle and bottom. 
the more we spend, the lower the percentage we spend on retargeting. I like to use the frequency as an indicator of whether or not I'm spending too much on the retargeting. So if you notice your ROAS on retargeting starts to drop and your CPA starts to rise, have a look at your frequency. If that is above four, you're spending too much on retargeting. Usually I try not to go above three, but if it's above four, then you definitely need to tone it down a bit with the spend on the retargeting. I rarely spend more than $150 a day on retargeting. So for accounts spending more than 10K a day on ads, I'm only spending like 1% or less of the daily budgets on retargeting. A big mistake in the industry I've seen is that they rely on one single ad that brings in all the revenue, but they aren't testing out more to find out winning ads, winning angles, or winning audiences. So make sure you focus a lot on constantly finding trends and testing them to get new winning angles for your ads. Yes, if you have an ad that converts well, then obviously keep scaling it, but don't leave yourself hanging in case the ad stops working. Okay, because the platform could change or one day Meta can randomly decide that your frequency is too high and then punish your ads. If you haven't tested and found other winning ads, you're basically back to square one. By constantly finding and testing out trends to get new winning ads, new winning angles and audiences, you will always have a way to scale further without having to rely on just that one ad. Okay, so now for the fun part, getting to $1,000 to $5,000 a day in spend. Ironically, this is probably the least stressful phase in terms of spending as the foundation is now set up correctly. We know our metrics, we know our numbers, and we have a product market fit. Otherwise, we would have made it this far. However, if you don't set everything up correctly, like we've outlined in this document, things can take a turn for the worst. If you're relying on hope instead of data, you can get yourself into trouble. Simplicity scales, complexity fails. So make sure you don't get too technical when setting up the campaigns and set it up as simple as possible. As I mentioned earlier, the goal is to get to broad. So don't work against the Facebook algorithm and let Facebook do its thing. If you follow what we've outlined, Facebook should actually be working in your favor, not working against you. So there are three frameworks that I use to scale ad spend. We have vertical CBO scaling, we have quick fire scaling, and then we have duplicating winning ad sets, which is horizontal scaling. So vertical CBO scaling is where we increase the budget of the proven campaign by 20% every 48 hours, but only increase if it's stable and profitable. That is why you always wait at least 48 hours before scaling again. If you accidentally reset Facebook's learning phase, wait an extra day just to make sure that your results are still consistent. If not, then leave it. If you notice that the results start to decline, decrease by 20%. Then quick fire scale, increase your budget by 20%, then wait two minutes, increase again by 20%. Only do the second 20% if your learning phase did not reset. And then thirdly, duplicate winning ad sets into a new campaign and raise the budget by 30 to 40 percent so every week just keep testing and scaling the ads that have a profitable cpa and ROAS for your brand keep it simple okay so now we have our scaling campaign set up you know we're making a lot of money we're getting a lot of sales the best sellers are consistently selling out uh, we now need to make tweaks based on the data so as long as your ads are profitable have a profitable cpa and a profitable ROAS keep scaling them up sky is the limit keep doing what works but if certain metrics are off below are, you know, if this, then that scenario is that you can use depending on which metric is underperforming and what actions you need to take to make your ads profitable again. If the cost per outbound click or CPM or cost per click is underperforming, then change either the copy or the creative of the ad and test again. Only change one at a time, of course, so you know what works and what doesn't when you're tested out. If your click-through rate is low, that means your CPC is higher, which indicates your ad content isn't working. So you need to test out a different creative. If you want to decrease your CPM, your cost per 1,000 impressions, you need to increase your audience size because your CPM is directly linked to the size of the audience. If your cost per view content is much higher than your cost per outbound click or CPC, it means you need to optimize your landing page. Why? Because people are clicking on your ads they're getting onto your page, but they're not taking the next step, okay? If your cost per ad to cart is really high compared to your cost per content view, you need to optimize your product page, okay? Make sure that the add to cart button is above the fold. Make sure that it's optimized for mobile and so on and so forth. So if there's a big drop off, you need to get back to the drawing board and identify a new market product fit with the corresponding audiences. Okay, so moving on, comparing the cost per purchase, CPA, 
with the cost per initiate checkout and it will basically tell you how the checkout process works. If there is a big drop off, so let's say 100 people at the initiate checkout, only 10 people place an order, which is a 10% conversion rate, 90% drop off rate. If that, you know, if that drop off is as big as it is, it's probably one of the following. You're charging huge shipping fees, customers can't find the information on return policies or shipping policies, or they don't have the right payment providers. This can be prevented with good market research and testing. Then if your ad frequency is above three, so like I said, four or more, then you've exhausted that audience or that creative and you need to refresh it. Okay, so when you're tweaking and optimizing, you want to let Facebook do the work for you, let the data speak for itself and then tweak again. Don't watch the campaign 24 seven, wait at least 48 hours to get accurate data. Changing it all the time will just result in you wasting money and you not getting enough data. Again, less is more. So. When you get enough data to tweak again, make sure you only change one thing at a time so you can determine if that one change was actually a good change or a bad change. Give it 48 hours and then again, repeat this cycle. Rushing will do you no good, so just follow the system that we've laid out for you. Okay, so if you've made it this far into the document, you now have a full understanding of the four pillars needed to scale your brand to a million dollars in sales. Scaling a brand can be complex, you know, requiring careful consideration, planning and execution. However, Facebook is one of the best places for Shopify stores and fashion brands to run ads on, thanks to its billion monthly active users and in-depth targeting features across its networks. All that is left for you to do now is to implement this and do it for yourself. But your results may not be the best because it does take a lot of time and attention, which may actually cost you more in the long run. Or you can work with us to reach a million dollars in sales in probably half the time without the mistakes you may face. As growth marketers, we encourage fashion stores to contact us directly for a free initial consultation. Obviously, we will gladly assist without any obligation with advice on how you can approach your particular challenge. All inquiries are taken seriously and answered individually by ourselves. So no sales team, you know, somewhere in a other country, nothing like that. You know, you'll either be speaking to me directly or Elliot, uh, my business partner in the UK. Okay, so what would happen if you would partner with us? Well, you'll be able to make more sales and profits while reducing costs. Your sales will grow consistently each month. You'll be at ease because you now have experts who can do all this for you. You can get to 1 million in sales in a year if you use the advice properly. You'll be able to know your customers on a deeper level. You can finally get rid of that cookie cutter agency. You can forget about your sales ever plateauing and you'll feel confident again because you'll know exactly what is happening, okay? So again, this is for lifestyle brands that wanna scale their brand to a million in sales in a year or less by using ads efficiently. If that sounds like you, you can claim your free consultation call here. We can hop on a quick call, see if we're a right fit for each other, see if we can actually help you scale up your brand to a million dollars in sales, and then proceed from there. Now, a couple of questions that we often get by people that book in these calls if we primarily focus on Instagram ads and Facebook ads for the marketing services, or are there any other channels that we utilize? Do we offer TikTok ads, for example? So our foundation is Facebook and Instagram. This will be your biggest growth channel. As we grow, we'll add TikTok, Google, and YouTube, depending on where your audience is. The goal, obviously, is to achieve omnipresence. Do we only do ads? Another question we often get. Although our prominent offering is paid advertising, we also offer guidance on other aspects of your brand, utilizing the experience of our own brands. Because like I said at the start, we actually have our own Shopify stores. Our aim is to help you achieve greater conversions, uh, average order values, and efficiency. Even a small increase of 1% in your website conversion rate can have potential to double your revenue from advertising alone. Who writes the captions for the ads? So the copy, the headline, etc. We write everything in line with your brand so that we attract the right audience. Do you handle the creatives completely or do you take input from the brand on the direction they would like to go with the creative part of it? So we will use the creatives you already have now to generate sales immediately while aligning with your brand's image and direction. And then we'll actively give you feedback on what creatives work so that you can replicate it and basically you know what creatives don't work. Who mainly runs the ads? Well, that'll be me. Uh, I am the main media buyer. Um, I oversee all of the ads, so no one is ever contracted. Everyone is you know, highly vetted internally. We don't have any you know, outsourcers in third world countries or nothing like that. Will I have access to all of the data and the numbers and all the stuff in the ads manager? Yes, the data belongs to you. We do not keep any of it. Even after we stop working together, it's all your data. How hands-on is the service? Do you go in and tweak the ads on a daily basis? So we are very hands-on. 
we monitor everything on a daily basis and we make changes if and when we feel is needed. So again, we let Facebook do its thing. We let the data decide when we make the changes. But yes, we are very hands on. What sort of ad spend do you think we need to start with? What's the return like? So on average, we like to start with two to 5K in the first month. Uh, specific returns will depend on your numbers, like your profit margin, your cost of goods sold, etc. Uh, but provided you have that product market fit, you should see a positive return within the first week or so. And then we just grow and progress from there. How often do you meet with clients? So what we do is we send all of our clients personalized weekly update videos. And in these videos, we share our screen to show the ads manager, the results of the previous week, recommendations for the store and the conversion rate and what our plans are for the week ahead. All existing clients also get a personal calendar link for any ad hoc video or Zoom meetings that they want to schedule. So on a daily basis, we speak on either Slack or WhatsApp. On a weekly basis, you get a video update. And then if you want to schedule a meeting alongside all of this, you can do so with our personal calendar link. Is there a way that we can be involved in the process and kind of start to see and understand what's going on and how everything is working? So when we do hop on calls or when we do send our video updates, we go over in exact detail what's happening so that you understand the process and that you can also give us feedback on what direction you'd like to see the brand go into. Okay, so we'll give you feedback on what creators work best, where the budget is going and so on and so forth. So you're basically in the loop as much as you want to be. How long have you guys been doing this? Well, we've had a successful track record for over five years now in the industry. Obviously, we have our own brands alongside this. Um, so we know what you go through on a day-to-day -day basis. How does the pricing model work? How do clients usually pay? Well, it's either a ads revenue share plus an extra price model or a percentage of ad spend or a flat fee, depending on your numbers and the goal for the brand. So we offer bespoke plans and we always generate a win-win situation. Otherwise, there's no point in working together, in my opinion. Okay, if I choose to proceed with this, what should we do next? What is the usual procedure for following the steps? So if you do actually become a client of ours, you will go through our automated onboarding process, which will give you um, or give us everything we need. So access to the creatives, access to the ads manager and so on and so forth. And this usually takes no longer than an hour, but after that, we will have everything we need and we can get started right away, okay? So all these agencies that say it takes a month or six weeks to get ads up and running, that is quite frankly ridiculous. We can get started right away as soon as we are onboarded, okay? So if this sounds interesting to you, you can claim your free consultation call here. Thanks for watching and I hope to speak to you soon.